Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Chris Burkhart, the Global Chief Information Security Officer at Accenture. With over 710,000 employees globally, Accenture is the world's largest technology consulting firm. Chris, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Hey, thanks, Laura. It's happy to be here. Now, tell us a little bit more about your company and your role. Get what's your thirty-second elevator pitch? Yeah, sure. So we are we are the world's largest technology technology consulting firm, as you say. Uh, my role as global chief information security officer is to keep our clients, our employees, and our companies safe from cyber threats, and to respond to the inevitable incidents when they do happen. Uh, it's very simple, uh, but it's very large in scope. It does not sound simple. I mean, it sounds simple as a sentence, but I'm guessing that keeping the world safe from hackers and people who would uh, seek to use their incredible talents for evil rather than for good uh, does does not sound like a job that is simple to execute. Well, sure, but perhaps the concept is simple, but execution can be tricky. Uh, I have a great team with a, a wide variety of skills, uh, and we, I think we managed to do a pretty good job uh, nobody's perfect, but we we have a lot of, I'll, I'll say, um, good advisors. We have a lot of good uh, teams that can execute well, uh, and we have passionate people who who really make this their mission. And those come together to to provide you know quite a great deal of capability. I've, I have to say, I've really enjoyed you know, getting to know your team over the last year or two, and I'm appreciating the fact that as part of the communication of the of the the tech and the content is things like roundtables and uh, industry conversations that your team and and the organization overall will hold for just leaders of all different companies. They don't even I don't know that they necessarily even have to be clients. It's just here we have news, we have updates that we want to share, and we want to inform the, the broader community so that everybody can protect themselves, clients right. and each other. And I just, I really admired that and have appreciated the opportunity to work with you in, in a lot of those kinds of endeavors. Oh, thank you. It's very kind of you to say. Yeah, so, there's a, there's a, just to kind of talk about that a little bit and, and I won't distract us too much, but there's this concept in information security of, a, of an information security poverty line. Uh, and it's kind of a corporate poverty line. And the concept is somewhere around a billion dollars in revenue uh, you you become capable and have enough money to protect yourselves in a properly in a cybersecurity manner. But if you're below that mark, uh, you are going to struggle unless you have a lot of managed service uh, providers helping you out. And I'm not sure I got that exactly right, but uh, it's a, it's an interesting, unique thing. And so I think we all have an accountability to. Uh, help help the system, right? We're all on the same side here. We're all against the bad guys. So it's not a competitive advantage thing. It is a, you know, we got to look out for your neighbor kind of thing. Yeah, I, that's an interesting phrase, the information security poverty line. And that's at a billion dollars? Uh, that's that's my understanding. Yeah. Wow. I'm, 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 we'll, we'll have to go check the facts after our recording, make sure we got that right. But that's that's still amazing. And to think that to the extent that it really does take a village to help keep everybody on the edge of of the strongest security levels, because, it, you know, what hurts one hurts all in one way, shape or form. And uh, wow, to at that point, I'm thinking most people are under the poverty line at that point. So that really yeah. to share that information with the wider population that, is so important. That's why there's so many managed security providers out there now. Right. There's everybody needs help. Yes, for sure, for sure. So in doing all of this, what's your favorite part of your job and why? Uh, my favorite part is developing people. I really enjoy that. We have, I think, just wonderful talent and helping them become better, whether it's through uh, business and professional type behaviors, cybersecurity training, experience, uh, you know, putting them in positions to succeed and supporting them, uh, that's at this point in my career, that's what makes me happiest. That, that's, I love it. Then in looking at all of this, uh, we just talked about a whole bunch of hot issues that are, I'm thinking more perpetual rather than of the day, but within all of it, what is one of the biggest issues of the day? And how do you have to adjust your approach when you're talking to different key stakeholder groups about it? Well, I, I think, just about anybody would agree that ransomware is probably our mm. biggest issue. It's certainly the one that 
uh, everybody, you know, everybody who uh, non non security professionals can really understand. It's in the it's in the news all the time. You can open any any news source you want, and there'll be a story about ransomware. And I think um, the attackers are almost seen as you know mythically skilled, right? That they they it feels like they can just get in anywhere and do anything they want. And in fact, um, what probably the most challenging part about about communicating this, especially upwards, is now in fact it's really a game of probabilities, right? There are there are um, easy ways for attackers to get in. There are you know more difficult ways, and there are extremely minute possibilities. And making sure that you spend your security resources in the right places to close the biggest gaps, you know, start with the big ones and move to the small ones in a very methodical way, uh, is a, can be a tricky concept. Because even if you do all the big gaps, there's still some small possibility they'll get in through a, a small gap. But you have to do that, and you have to you have to be methodical about it, and you have to be complete about it. So explaining that, Laura, to uh, senior leadership. Um, you, you can't use the technical words. You, you have to say, well, you know, we're going to close the, the the easy gap, which is um, multi-factor authentication, for example. Almost all of us now do this on our email. You get the little code over your phone and then you can log in and, and it's great. And 10 years ago, that wasn't the case, but that was an easy concept to explain. Sometimes concepts are harder and you just have to figure out good analogies to explain them with, whether it's um, locking, you know, locking the outside door of your house versus locking all the inside doors of your house and having the alarm system and having the fence and, you know, using these types of analogies. What I like to do, um, what I like to do is I just like to put it in business terms and, you know, probabilities, likelihoods. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll say, well, look, if we if we spend this money. Or you know we're gonna we're gonna eliminate this risk, right? And this is an important risk to eliminate. Here are some news stories about people who didn't eliminate this risk, right? We need to go do that. When I talk to my colleagues and peers throughout the organization, I have to be much more. I do have to embrace the technical, and I have to explain exactly what I'm asking them to do. So if there is, a, I don't know, a firewall change that has to be done, or a new technology that we need to, to screw in to stop a particular kind of attack. I have to be precise and I have to tell them, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to do it. And here's why they need to understand the why, because if they can understand the why there's a much greater chance that they, they, they won't do it improperly. They'll do it in a way that is, that, that is complete uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm one person and my team is not that big centrally. So we really rely on the expertise of all of these other people to apply our controls in the right way. It sounds like when people understand the why, in, in your case, the why is the risk factor, that it increases people's vigilance and their attention to detail and, and understanding what's at stake for them, uh, which at that point makes people's internal quality control meter go up a lot higher. Is that, am I interpreting that right? Uh, that, that's exactly right, right? If, if people can if people can internalize the the attack that we're trying to defend against, there's just a much better chance that they're going to think about it in ways that we never would or that my team never would because we don't we don't see their world every day, right? So they're going to say, oh, well, if I'm protecting this and I sh then then I, then I need to protect this and this and here's how I should configure it to per, you know prevent that attack. And it can be a very powerful thing. And if you don't do the why and you just say, well, yeah, you got to go implement this because I said so, you're not going to get the same result. You're just not right. You you have to, you know, um, to 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 use your uh, your catchphrase, speaking to influence, right? That's what you have to do. And you want to influence them to be. Um, paranoid in a <laughs> healthily paranoid right yes, like, yes. You know, so because the, the the attackers really are out to get us and being a little bit paranoid about that is a helpful trait a healthy level of paranoia i think that's a that's an important level for all of us especially and i'm perfectly happy to have my cybersecurity team be uh healthily paranoid for me that keeps me <laughs> at ease so uh thank you for that <laughs> and with the uh, and in doing that so the you've got a lot of different audiences that you need to connect with who's the toughest audience that you ever had to get through to 
Ooh, um, well, I think uh, one of the tougher conversations that I have to have on an annual basis uh, is with our our security or sorry, pardon me, our insurance underwriters. Um, like many large corporations, we have some level of, of cybersecurity insurance. And the challenge with this particular group of individuals is they have such a wide breadth of understanding of cybersecurity. Some are just amazingly detailed in their understanding of it. Others, this is, you know, it's a second or third hat they wear uh, as part of their as part of their experience. And you mix that with the fact that they see companies that are also on a wide spectrum of their journey to, you know, cybersecurity completeness, if there is such a thing. Uh, and so you get some strange questions and you get some um, in, in both directions. Uh, I remember I remember speaking, I think this was a couple of years ago to the group, and we went through our cybersecurity defenses and some of the technical defenses. And at the end of it, one of the questions was, um, so can you confirm you have spam filtering on your email and mm. you know for, for us of, of course we do right that's a that's almost every company has that and but that was the question we got and then on the other end you know i had another person asking me uh, you know details about our firewall configuration and <laughs> segmentation all these very technical things and so i think when you have an audience that has um different levels of understanding uh i think you know Speaking to them is it can can be can be challenging, and you really just have to practice. And and you know I like to I like to kind of mix um, a few key technical details along with an overall story, and then move to questions. But it's not a I don't know it's not a simple thing. No, it never is. And that, you bring up an interesting point that I hear a lot when I'm um, working with professionals who have to address an audience, large or small, where there's likely to be a range, but you just never know, especially with, with some of the smaller ones, that, you know, when you've got a really large audience, you can kind of guess that there's a greater likelihood that you will have someone on either end of the experience bell curve, so to speak. But when you get a, a smaller audience of particularly uh, high rolling players, let's put it that way. You can never necessarily guess that there are people I have worked with who have said, I, I, I never know if I'm going to have somebody on this end of the bell curve or the other end. Are they going to be the super high tech or the, like, yeah. I don't care at all. Just give me the bottom line. How do you predict? And if you can't predict, how do you decide what degree of detail to start with in order to gauge their their comprehension, their interest, et cetera. What are, what's a strategy that people can use, um, especially if you're dealing with someone where in their cultural space, there's a lot of international, you know, global multinational companies where it's like, well, for this particular group, I can't just come straight out and ask. So are you people who like a lot of detail? You know, how much experience do you have in this area? Is this something that you're comfortable D discussing that you enjoy the tech where you can't explicitly, you know, gauge or request information to gauge their level of, we'll call it sophistication in the area without causing in uh, inappropriate offense. How do you, what's, right. what's an indirect way that you can gauge <clears throat> that? Well, I always, what I do, I, I, I do two things. First, I, I start with a simpler, a simpler level, and I assume not a deep understanding. Because if you start at the other end, people are afraid to ask questions, right? They, they maybe don't understand the technical stuff you're throwing at them. And they're going to be perhaps embarrassed to raise their hand and say, you know, hey, I, I really don't get what you're talking about. So if you but if you start lower, and the other thing you have to do is you have to encourage questions early on, if you start lower, people will ask questions about the next level of detail, right? They'll ask about, well, have you thought about this? Or, you know, can, can you speak a little bit more about that? And that's, I, I find that that is, uh, at, at least with small and medium-sized groups, that's a good way to do it uh, because you don't alienate people. And the worst that happens is, um, you know, they feel like they're a little bit smarter than you, and, and which is absolutely fine, right? That's a, it's, it's not a terrible thing. But the best thing that happens is you get into a great dialogue because based on their questions, you can zoom right in. Uh, and which is what I, I zoom in on what they want to talk about. And then that's when you get the great discussions.
Now that's, that's okay. I want to tap into one other thing that you just said, the idea that, okay, maybe they'll think that they're smarter than you are and whatnot. I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of people listening right now who are terrified that that's what's going to happen, that they're going to come across as not being smart, or as they're going to come across as, uh, you know, the, where the audience is going to think that they're not an expert, that they're dumb, they're going to humiliate themselves, they're going to torpedo the the opportunity because they're going to not represent well. Or most people tend to err on the other side, where they give so much information and detail because they're trying to prove that they're an expert. They're trying to prove that they did the work. They're trying sure. to prove themselves, sometimes to themselves, not just to the audience. But they they tend to err on well, the other side. We've all, so we've all sat through those conversations, and yeah, probably some of us. Us, including me have led one or two perpetuated them yes of course <laughs> we've all fallen fallen prey to that fear so for those whose hackles just went up when you said oh well you know worst comes to worst they think they're smarter than you are because you didn't talk at a high enough level to start what do you say to them well i i say self-confidence is a really important thing to have and i think uh, um in in my in my career i've learned that it's really not important to be the smartest person in the room, right? It's important to get the smartest people in the room speaking with each other so we can all learn, right? And if you happen to be one of those, that's great. But there's, gosh, there's such deep disciplines now and there's such, you know, deep, but very narrow areas of knowledge in all the technology that we do and the security domains that we work on. You just can't possibly be the smartest person about every topic. I mean, that's a, nobody can be that person. So encouraging those people to ask questions and talk and and engage in dialogue is that's that's how we all get smarter, right? That's an important thing to do. Yes, yes, um, and it, allowing I think encouraging more of those questions helps you to gauge the the level of desire and interest and ability and whatnot of the audience, and then you can of course adjust your own accordingly, the, the degree of detail and whatnot that you give so that in case there was that initial first impression that perhaps you're not uh, quite right. as smart as they are, you can you can change that quickly. You know, there's, there's always the opportunity to uh, shift the gears and allow them to see that that first impression may not have been. Yeah, accurate. I mean, no, nobody wants to attend, you know, second grade classes when they're in fourth grade, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, you have to be able to tailor, uh, but, uh, Worrying about, you know, I think you want you want your audience to be better for having spent time with you. Now, what's an important lesson that you learned when you went from being an individual contributor to leading your very first team? I, I Laura, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you uh, two. I think I think probably the the most important thing if I, I guess if i really had to pick one is delegating accountability i think that delegating accountability is something that i really see many people struggle with uh new leaders in particular and i and, and i was no different when you're an individual contributor you're in total control of the deliverable that you're producing and, and when you're a leader all you can do is uh, you know, coach and edit and review the final product until you're happy. And you have to give people enough room to be creative, to do their job well. You can't micromanage them. And you also have to let them make mistakes. So for me, it was hard. Uh, I was early in my career, I was a programmer. I programmed in Gosh, um, Unix shell script, which people still use for lots of things, and, and C, which is probably a dying language now. And I really enjoyed it. I liked the I liked producing um, good looking code that was efficient and and was. Um, uh, Elegant. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to say I produced a work of art, but I was, <laughs> you know, I was I was of course proud of some of the work that I did. And so when I had a team and had to help them um, produce deliverables, uh, it was frustrating at times because their personal definition of, of good enough or elegant or done didn't always match mine, right? And, but that's okay, right? They're, they're you know, uh, ultimately the code has to do what the code has to do. There are lots of ways to do that. 
What, what did it mean to you in that role when you're leading your first team of coders to let people make mistakes? How did that manifest? Well, what did it, it look like? Yeah. So, uh, for, so for me, uh, there were times when I could see that the path that they were going down to solve a problem in their code, uh, because we would discuss these things like, okay, mm -hmm. how are you going to do this? And I could see that there were going to be some bumps in the road along the way, right? You know, mm -hmm. maybe they were as maybe they were trying to do it with a particular um, a particular database query that wasn't just wasn't going to work given uh, you know our database design, or you know, something along those lines. And I would just, I, you know, I would let them. I'd let them make that mistake if it, if it were, if they were going to make it in a in a smallish amount of time and we had room in the deadlines, right? If they were really sure that their approach was going to work better than yours, they wanted to do it a certain way. You said, "Fine, do it your way." Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't immediately, Laura. I didn't immediately offer a solution. Right. Mm -hmm. Part of the joy of being a coder is figuring stuff out. Right. And I didn't want to steal that joy from people. Right. You know, coming uh, coming to a solution yourself feels really good, and letting them you know make a mistake or two on the, on the way maybe even makes that feel better now you have to balance that and i had to balance that against deadlines and against um the amount of work that we had to get done in a certain period of time i couldn't let somebody work on a module for uh, you know days and weeks when they when they really need to have it done in eight hours but uh, there's time to make small mistakes and there's time to find them out when you do your testing and there's time to, sit to to kind of write your code and then see the results and think to yourself, oh, I guess that didn't work. I need a different approach. And sometimes they'd figure it out. Sometimes they would come and they'd talk to their, their colleagues or talk to me and work through it. And we'd work through it together. But uh, getting people to try stuff, right? And getting people to make that mistake is how people grow. And I, I, tr I try as much as I can not to cheat people out of that experience. Right. The important, the the lessons that people can afford to learn the hard way without doing irrevocable, irrevocable damage to themselves or to anybody else. I guess that's the the key yeah. line of demarcation. So so to, to fast forward, um, I'm working with my team right now on a on a software implementation, uh, and there are some challenges uh, with the way the vendor designed it and how it's going to work in our environments, client environments, and the 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 man who's leading that project he's very good he's years and years of delivery one of the best ever and he and i actually are now meeting um because we're, we're beyond he and i are probably both beyond the, the joy of solving everything in our <laughs> careers right sure uh, but, but we're meeting every day to actually work through that problem together to think about okay what can we ask our people to do what can we ask the vendor to do how can we make this work together to get to get past this problem and that is not a meeting where I berate him for not solving it. That is a meeting where we are trying to help each other figure out how to get through this thing, right? And that, you know, that is, that's the approach that you have to take if you want to solve a problem. Yes. Yes. Well, Chris, this brings us to our 24-hour influence challenge. Since we've been talking about solving problems, this is your opportunity to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our audience today? Sure, thanks, Laura. I, I'm gonna say, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and ask you to take three steps, but okay. one is within 24 hours. Good. So pick anywhere between one and three people who are on your team or who you regularly directly influence or work for you. And I want you to give them <clears throat> one piece, one developmental coaching piece, just one nugget that they can work on to make themselves a better uh, a, a better contributor or a more healthy contributor to your choice. But do it in the next 24 hours, follow it up again in a week with one more piece and in a month with one more piece and check, check back with them on how they're doing on each of the previous chunks and if that's working for them. Take the time, make it a good nugget. You owe it to them to give them good developmental feedback. That's, and I hope everybody out there heard that last piece. This is not just for you. You owe it to them, right, from the from the CISO's mouth. So you owe it to your team to give them this feedback. And so, Chris, uh, picking the pe person or people, picking the nugget you're going to give to them and giving that first nugget 
in the within those 24 hours and arguably maybe also putting on the calendar that a week away and a month away putting a little reminder on the calendar to uh, sure. to follow up on those so putting those reminders on the calendars can also be done in that 24 hours yes that's a great point yes Okay. So otherwise, I don't know about you if you're like me when I'm always like, yes, yeah, so a week from now or a month from now, I will totally get around to doing this. And I know I've learned there's a voice in my head who I have learned to squash. And that's the little voice in my head that says, no, I don't need to write this one down. I'll remember. As soon as I hear myself say, I don't need to write this down. I'll remember it. I go, OK, where's my pen? Where Or where's the, the computer? Right. I have to write it down because that is the voice of doom speaking to me very <laughs> sweetly and to my ego saying, you, Laura, you're fine. You don't need any help to remember this. No. Yes, that that is absolutely the voice of doom. So if you have a voice of doom in the back of your head as well, squash it. And as soon as you hear it, reach for the pen or the keyboard and put a note on the calendar. So uh, love it. Okay. Reach out and make sure you give people, oh, Chris, so what is the option if you don't lead a team? What if you're an entrepreneur, if you're starting up, if you're a one-man show so far, just have a, you know, a handful of people working together, but you don't have direct reports? What's your version of that? If you don't have a direct report, uh, perhaps there is somebody you work with or a, a close peer or uh, somebody else who you can give a piece of coaching to who, who is who is not going to view it as you know you <laughs> you getting in their business so to speak uh, but surely we, we all have somebody that we care about and and that's the point here is you care about them uh, that you want to give some advice to that is constructive advice that will will potentially help them down the road um, and the worst case, if, if you really have nobody, step back and look at yourself and think about if, if you were your own boss, what would your what, what would your one nugget be to you? You know, it's it's interesting in psychology. There is a technique called the two chair technique, which is if you literally put two chairs next to each other and you you play yourself now in when you're sitting in this one chair talking to whoever the other person is or the other version of you, the listener, the receiver in the other chair, and you actually move from chair to chair and look at the person in that other chair as you're having that, mm -hmm. that conversation. And when you force yourself to actually articulate those, those thoughts out loud, it's, it's interesting to see what comes out of your mouth and what, what pops into your brain that right. you never would have just thought yourself through what, where it's just a really different world when you have to force your your broad concepts, emotions, feelings, and whatnot into words. So uh, it, for those out there who don't have anybody else need to coach yourself on this one, try the two chair yeah. technique. So yeah, go, go, yeah. Your listeners should go sit in the boss chair. <laughs> go sit in the boss chair. Yes. I love it. And so be the boss of yourself first and then go from there. Okay. Now what's an example of a communication related mistake that you've made along the way? I'm going to share, I'm going to share a story that is, Oh, still a little uncomfortable to tell, but uh, I'll, I'll share it nonetheless. So it's no secret Accenture had uh, a an incident at the end of last summer, almost a year ago, uh, almost a year ago to the day. And, and when we talk, when you talk about incidents for those not in cybersecurity, what does that mean? Yeah, so that means we had uh, we had an attacker have some success, and they got some data from Accenture. A hacker came in and managed yep. to break through. Okay. Yep. Uh, the dreaded ransomware threat actor. So um, I think overall we handled the incident well. Uh, but there was one thing that I, I'm, I would really love to have a do over and it's a communication mistake. So as we were investigating this incident, one of the things that you do is you, you um, or th that we all do when we investigate these is we try to understand what data was taken. And as we were understanding that, um, we found uh, some data that referred to, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 clients. Um, and none of this was highly confidential data. In fact, a lot of it was actually uh, practice data, for lack of a better word. Uh, but the mistake that we made is somewhere along the lines, um, somebody said, we have, uh, you know, we found uh, 60 impacted clients and we, and we have that list. And our the, the people that we said this to, we said this to a lot of our, our client account leads and different, and different clients and other internal people. And they immediately presumed the corollary was also true that if, if, if you weren't on this list, your data was not impacted as a client. 
And we were frankly not far enough along in the investigation for anybody to draw that conclusion, but we didn't make that as clear as we needed to make it. And of course, once somebody drew that corollary, shared it with their friend, their friend said, you know, oh, well, my client's also not on that list. So therefore, they're, they also must not be impacted. And that, that spread, that, that wrong message spread. And I think I learned a few things from that. No, number one was um, not only to be clear in our communications, but to be complete in our communications, right? And number two, I learned that it's really important when we have cybersecurity practitioners speaking to non-practitioners that we we have a, a brief little discussion about how incidents work. And I'll say, much like a police investigation, uh, a cyber incident investigation has a plan and it has stages and it has completion and all those are fairly well-defined things. But if you don't understand it as an outsider, you don't know where you are on that roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so it's important, it's important to give context and it's important to give very complete statements. So I, I wish I could do that one over because it caused us a lot of unnecessary, uh, unnecessary pain. Um, and, you know, it wasn't even something that we said. It was just something that was misinterpreted because we didn't say the other thing well enough. Yes, it's interesting. So this is the list. We know that these people are not affected, but that does not mean that if you're not on the list, that there isn't another list that we're right. going to dis discover right. later on. This and Here's the, the temporary, here's the most yeah. up-to-date list. Stay tuned for updates uh, later. And, and I think we even kind of said that, but it just, you know, people also, I think maybe a third thing is people want to hear good news. They want to mm. hear what they want to hear. Right? Yes. And so there's a little, there's certainly a little bit of that going on and, and that's, you know, that's okay. People are people. It's not a, it's, it's not a, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. Sure. It's just a, 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 you know, miscommunication happens. And that's my, that's my probably least favorite example of it personally. Understood. <laughs> but thank you for sharing it with us. It's a, it's a solid example. And so, so let's, let's turn to something more positive. And that's if somebody else in your organization wanted to move up into a senior leadership role, aside from their technical expertise, what's one skill that they'd have to demonstrate and why? Well, I, I, you'll love this. I mean, I think it is actually communication. I think in, in senior leadership roles in cybersecurity, you have to be able to communicate. I have to be able to communicate incidents or um, externalities or what have you that are in the cyber realm to, our, to, to my senior leadership and our board, right? So I have to be able to say, um, hey, this happened to this company and here's what it means. Or um, we need to go invest in this technology and here's why. And I have to do that in business terms that they can understand. So I have to say, well, this is going to reduce our tax surface uh, and we're less likely to have incidents. Or this is going to, um, this is a requirement that we have to do to meet regular regulations and here's what it means for us. But I also have to be able to communicate to um the people on my team and on their teams about what they're actually going to do to make that happen. And I have to be able to understand the technology. And when I get a directive from our, you know, our CEO or the board or my boss to go do something, I have to interpret that and communicate it to my team in a way that they can go actually effectively do it. So if you can't communicate um, technically with your team and business businessy with your board and your your CEO, you know, you're going to fail in the role. Um, I like to use, uh, probably people tell you when they read my emails, I, I'm a big fan of bullet point lists. I'm a big fan of fact-based communication. Uh, I very clearly articulate what is my opinion and what are the facts. And it, it just, um, I keep the emotions out of it. And I think that's an important thing. That all those things are important things to do when you're communicating important topics that can be, um, you know, that can be scary. Yes, that ability to translate your expertise for those who both have it and for those who don't. We talked about that bell curve earlier, but yep. uh, the, the the translation uh, of that knowledge, I think, is is so key, and so many people miss it and just sort of 
go slide into what I like to call the expert's curse, that they forget what other people don't know, don't understand, don't need to know or understand right. it, don't want to know or understand, or for that matter, what they do need and want to understand, but don't already. So what will you have to teach? That's, and yeah. that's an important no, uh, empathy point. No, Nobody wants to know how the sausage is made. Right? They just don't. <laughs> right? They, they, they want to know. They want to know how they should feel about it and how they should react to it. And that's, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And I think uh, for, for me, um, for me, it's knowing the audience. Uh, I have to know how to write to my boss. I have to know how to communicate to the to the board. I have to know how to communicate to the, my colleagues on my team. And they have different they have different things that they're interested in and different things they want out of it. And I don't always get it right. But, you know, I, I, I think I get it right often enough that that uh, people are patient enough with me. So, and that's the key, right? It's just getting people to be patient enough so that they get you are able to share what you need to share and they get what they need to get out of it. Yep. That's a happy medium. Well, Chris, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. How can people learn more about you and Accenture? Well, you can go to Accenture.com. Uh, we were recently named uh, the H, uh, HCF Research's number one cybersecurity services provider. Uh, and you can see on our website what good communication looks like. We have case studies and we have all uh, sorts of uh, bits and pieces about security that uh, uh, anybody who is into that kind of thing should find interesting. Perfect. Um, and of course, people can find you and follow you on LinkedIn, follow you in other places. If they I, want to I am on LinkedIn, Laura, but I will I will admit to not being a frequent updater. But I do have for the for the for your listeners out there, I do have a number of of um, podcasts that are you know they're bite sized they're they're ten to fifteen minutes. Uh, some of them are about career, some of them are about incidents. So if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, cybersecurity at Accenture specifically, you can listen to some of those. And where can we find those? Uh, you can find them on LinkedIn under my profile. Perfect. Perfect. And of course, we'll put the link to that in the in the show notes for everybody who does want to take you up on that invitation. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been my pleasure, Laura. Thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you uh, for joining us today. And always be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, which apparently are not the same thing, and all your favorite platforms so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thank you for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.